Hello, and welcome uh, to Faces and Places in Fashion. We're thrilled to have you all here today. I know we have lots of visitors, so welcome. Uh, we have this class uh, presentation every week on Mondays at 4.15, where we have an opportunity to hear from uh, fashion executives, creative directors, and so on and so forth in the fashion industry. So we're really thrilled today to have the Under Fashion Club uh, today, and I will tell you a little bit about them. But before I do that, just a, qu a few quick uh, things for the students. Uh, just as a reminder, um, next week, if you noticed on the schedule, we're going to be meeting in the Haft uh, Theater rather than here in the Katie Murphy. And next week, we'll have the Fashion Service Network panel speaking with us. So that'll be over in the Haft. So just go directly there. They're going to start renovating this space uh, starting in a few days. Also, for some of you, I know you were looking for your position papers. Those will be coming uh, next week, so no worries. It's taking me a little bit of time to get through all of them. Also, next week, you'll be receiving your final exam via email that you'll be doing at home and bringing with you. Sounds very exciting, right, for all the non-students? <laughs> Uh, and then finally, if any of you did turn in uh, a fashion event papers, I know there was a little bit of confusion on dates, so if you did turn it in today, I, I won't count it as late. It's my gift to you. All right, so on to what's important today. I, again, I'm really excited to have the Under Fashion Club here today. This is an event we've been working on for the past few months, along with the alumni group here at FIT. Um, and I'm going to introduce to you uh, the woman who really helped to make this possible, and also an FIT graduate, Karen Bromley. She's the principal of the Bromley Group, uh, a public relations and events agency specializing in retail and apparel here in New York City. As I mentioned, she's a graduate of FIT. Uh, she graduated from the buying and merchandising program. She's also a member of the board and the executive committee of the Under Fashion Club. So welcome to Karen Bromley today. Thank you very much. And I'll let Karen then introduce everyone on the panel today. Pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Can I, yeah. Is that good? Okay. Congratulations to anyone who's here who's a graduate and uh, to all the undergraduates. Um, I'm very excited to have such an elite panel here today. We are really looking at uh, the breadth and scope of many aspects of the intimate apparel industry, which is really one of the most exciting fashion industry um, segments today, I believe, and we believe. Uh, I want to thank the Alumni Relations Committee here, Yolanda, Miriam, and Joshua. They've been great. We've worked together on Fashion Service Network, too, and it's been fabulous. First, I want to introduce Victor Vega. Victor is the president of the Under Fashion Club, and he also is the senior VP of WACO, uh, heads up sourcing, manufacturing, planning, and operations. We were joking around before because Victor has been with WACO for 42 years, which is in and of itself an achievement. And today, it's kind of rare to have that kind of fabulous loyalty, which we all respect. So, Victor, thank you so much. Good afternoon. The Under Fashion Club has been in existence for 56 years. Um, most of the members of the Under Fashion Club are from all facets of our industry. And um, that says a lot about the club and about the service that we give, which is to the students. The Femi Gala is a premier event in our industry and is worldwide recognized. The Femi Gala is where we acquire our funds to support the students. The disbursement of those funds are given through the SAGE Committee, uh, which is the one that uh, gives us scholarships and, and internships. We are very pleased every year to support the students, and in particular FIT, which is the major recipient of these uh, funds that we collect at the Femi Gala. Um, I'm trying to make it this short so you can go into the panel and uh, you don't want to hear me, so I'm going to introduce Cil Clelia Parisi, which is the co-chair of the SAGE Committee, which is in charge of uh, disbursing the funds, and she will give you a little bit more detail about the money and where it comes from and where it goes. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone. The SAGE Committee Scholarships, Internships, Awards, and Grants is um, a, a major part of the Under Fashion Club. It's our, some of our most direct connecting with young people in the industry as the young people in the industry are going to serve the industry and we are trying to help them along and in any way we can. We have different ways of doing that. We have scholarships where we interview sixth semester students from the design and the business and technology section of FIT and um, give out wonderful scholarships and encourage any of you who are thinking about looking into that, um, please do because we want to see the best of the best and see those who are interested particularly in intimate apparel. We have internships, um, specifically in the summertime, which is um, another great program because the Under Fashion Club sponsors paid internships and it's a big deal. We get a lot of good companies involved. We are sponsors of the lingerie contest at the Femi Gala. And it's amazing to see the garments that are presented at this gala in front of five, six, seven hundred of the top industry people. And the exposure they get is phenomenal. So it's all fantastic. Um, we encourage all of you to get to know Under Fashion Club, get to know what our programs do, and um, learn more about it so we can see more of you in the industry because we really, really want you. Thank you. Uh, the club mission is education today for a better industry tomorrow. The video that you are about to see will explain very clearly our mission. For over 50 years, the Under Fashion Club has served as a leading not-for-profit dedicated to the intimate apparel industry, from industry icons to fostering tomorrow's leaders. The mission of the Under Fashion Club is education today for a better industry tomorrow. Throughout the year, the Under Fashion Club routinely hosts informational seminars and networking events. Additionally, with an eye toward the future, the club works closely with the Fashion Institute of Technology to foster young designers and help them to learn about, experience, and ultimately join the field of intimate apparel. Since 2003, through this relationship partnering with FIT, the annual student design contest allows students to bring their visions for the future of the intimate apparel industry to life and to share those ideas with the community. Those visions then serve as the basis for the Under Fashion Club's annual Hallmark event, the Femi Awards. Here, the industry's leaders meet and the students' designs are showcased while industry veterans are recognized. Josie Natori explains the importance of the club to the industry. The Under Fashion Club does an amazing job supporting education and bringing new creative minds into the field. This is what drives innovative products moves the industry forward. Students who participate in the Femi Design Contest have the unique opportunity to work hand in hand with FIT's professor, Alexandra Armelius, to produce couture garments that are featured on display at the annual event in front of over 600 intimate apparel industry members. The Femi Contest prepares the students for the world in a wonderful way because they're creating masterpiece garments so they're very transformed and empowered by the process. The Under Fashion Club Femi Design Competition has definitely helped me to define my career because they've given us the opportunity to showcase really couture garments that would otherwise not be seen by the industry. Beyond the red carpet of the Femi Awards, the Under Fashion Club also provides unmatched support through financial assistance and opportunities for students to access the intimate apparel industry. Victor Vega, Under Fashion Club President, explains. The Under Fashion Club supports the FIT students through scholarships and internships, which allow the students to bring the knowledge and experience acquiring class to the real world environment. 
As the intimate apparel industry continues to grow, the Under Fashion Club remains dedicated to education both for students in the classroom as well as those in the field through unique educational events that are held throughout the year. The club brings together the best of all worlds, opportunity, networking, educational support, and a roadmap to the future in intimate apparel. Well, I hope that gives you all a good idea as to what the Under Fashion Club does and also the support that we do give FIT through internships, scholarships, and the design contest. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we actually were here and we interviewed, I think, about, what, 17 people for scholarships? Um, the work that was presented to us was absolutely incredible. You guys do an amazing job here, so congratulations to all of you. We're really excited about the future of uh, you all in the intimate apparel industry. So now I'm just going to introduce the panel, and then we'll have a period of Q&A. <coughs> And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the different uh, opportunities that there are in the industry and the different roads that people have taken to kind of get there. First, I'd like to introduce Alex Frumberg. Alex is actually a graduate, a recent graduate of FIT. Um, she has her doctorate degree in design and in photography. Um, most recently, she graduated um, and became very quickly the creative director of Elite Brands, a company, uh, a camera company that does design and innovation, innovative designing of bags for cameras. And the project that um, Alex actually headed up was for designer Isaac Mizrahi. But what really impresses me about Alex, um, and she has recently formed her own company, ALX Creatives, is that she, throughout her career here at FIT, had a tremendous amount of internships, experience. She was always out there doing freelance and working and doing all kinds of, um, just reaching out for all kinds of opportunities to expand her dimension in terms of being a student and when she came out into the working world, was able to really be prepared to take on a very unusual um, career path and starting out with creative directing, photography, and uh, we're just really happy to have her here. We worked with her uh, in Intima magazine. She actually has shot a lot of intimate apparel for the industry, and um, you can see her website as well. Amy Bittner also is a graduate of FIT. Um, Amy is a member of the board of the Under Fashion Club, we're delighted to say. And she was a design assistant at the Murray Group, and now uh, she, oh, actually, you are a design assistant at the Murray Group, I'm sorry, but you started out at Ralph Lauren right, in design. So you graduated from the design school here at FIT. And also, um, Amy was one of our finalists at the Under Fashion Club, the FEMI, which you saw a little bit of here, and uh, received a scholarship from the Under Fashion Club. Maureen Stabno it represents our online retail community, the fast-growing community of online intimate apparel. She is the Senior Vice President of Merchandising at BareNecessities.com. I'm sure you've all heard of that. Um, we, uh, Bare Necessities actually was one of the original online uh, intimate apparel companies that quickly grew um, to become one of the largest uh, online uh, operations. And prior to that, Maureen was the senior VP and DMM of Intimate Apparel at Lord & Taylor. And prior to that, she was in sales at Wacol and Federated Merchandising, which is now Macy's Inc. Seth Morris uh, represents Carol Hockman Design Group. He is the president and CEO. He also was the recipient this year uh, of the Under Fashion Club Award for Humanitarian. 
And uh, Seth and his family have been in the intimate apparel business since, not Seth himself, but <laughs> the family from the mid 40s. Uh, so he brings a tremendous amount of history and knowledge to the intimate apparel industry and has been in many different facets of the industry. And now uh, their company, uh, with the family company, was actually taken over, uh, purchased by um, Comar, Comar Brands. And now they are one of the largest sleepwear companies in the world. And Seth heads that up. Sonia Winter is the president of Chantel, uh, which is the U.S. subsidiary of the group Chantel, which is a French company. And prior to becoming president of Chantel, uh, Sonia was at L'Oreal with a background in marketing and coach, and then formally at Warnico. And she joined Chantel in 1999. It is now one of the top three uh, branded department store uh, brands in, in this country and in specialty stores. And I remember when Chantel was first introduced to this country, it was just this little tiny company. And now with uh, Sonia's great direction and guidance, they now are a powerhouse. Tina Wilson is next. Yes, Tina. Tina also um, is a graduate of a design school, but it is an FIT, so, but it is Parson, so <laughs> you guys are all friends, I know. Um, and uh, Tina actually started out with Christian Dior Lingerie. That was her first design job. And then she was selected personally by Calvin Klein to become head designer on the launch of Calvin Klein Underwear, which is a brand I'm sure that we all know very, very well and own. Uh, in addition, she uh, moved on from that company and went on to become design director at Donna Karen Intimates. And and uh, which was at that time the licensee was at WACO. And now she is a freelance design consultant and works with several companies in the industry, including uh, Charlie Comar, Carol Hoffman, and works on the brands on Gossamer, Donna Karen, Nicole Miller, Lucky Brand, Oscar De Laurenta, probably a few others um, that I'm not remembering. So thank you. She also is the creator of her own company, Control Freak, which hopefully she'll tell us a little bit about. It's a new brand of shapewear that um, she has designed and patented. And Victoria Vandegraaff, uh, who is the president of D2 Brands, which is a division of Delta Galil. Delta Galil is an Israeli-based company. Um, they are almost a billion-dollar brand, and they do they have a very large uh, representation here in the United States as well as in Tel Aviv. Um, Victoria and I know each other actually from when she was the president of Bendon Intimates, and Bendon, for those of you who uh, may not know that name, but you will know the name Elle McPherson, which is one of the brands that Victoria developed and brought here to the United States, along with Stella McCartney. And last but not least, Barbara Lipton. Barbara is the group vice president of Macy's Intimates and uh, prior and Activewear. Prior to that, she was at Saks, she was buyer, DMM in merchandising, and formerly also worked with Waco and with Soma Intimates. So I think you could see that we have a very diversified, broad panel here today. And we wanted to give you um, an idea of the scope and the breadth of some of the different opportunities that are out there in the industry. And not always uh, do you come into an industry through a very direct path. So to start off, I thought I would ask Barbara to share a little bit of her background as to how your, you know, how you channeled your career and what were some of the, um, I guess, the most important uh, obstacles that you had to overcome to get to where you are today. Of course, um, as. 
Karen said, um, I really started my career at Saks Fifth Avenue. I was there for 19 years. Um, it's, and today, it is unusual to have someone at a company for so long. I worked my way up from assistant buyer all the way up through buyer to VP DMM. Um, and after 19 years, really had to think about where I wanted to be in five years, where I wanted to be in 10 years. And I think for me, the biggest um, chance that I had to take was what my next step was going to be. And where I wanted to be, I wanted to be a little bit more well-rounded. I really knew the retail side of it. But in order for me to grow and to be into my next position, I needed to learn the wholesale side of it. So I made the really tough decision. Sometimes you kind of have to take a step backwards to take a step forwards. So that's when I actually left Saks Fifth Avenue and I went into the wholesale side. I worked for Walkhole for two years. I actually worked with Tina, um, running the DK and Wine Donna Karen division. And that's where I really had to open myself up to a whole new experience that I had no no, I really had no understanding of. And so it took me about two years to really hone my skills, understand the other side of the business. So by the time I'm where I'm sitting today as a group vice president of Macy's, I actually have production, sourcing, design, and merchandising all together. So I think the big learning is you have to sort of think about what do you want to be, where do you want to be, and kind of make the decision for yourself. Um, and I, again, was very happy at Sags had to make that decision, but for me to get to where I am today, I had to make some choices in my career that were very, very difficult, but very happy that I made those decisions. Thank you. Victoria, how about you? Um, you asked what the biggest obstacles were, yes? So, you know, I think my story is a bit the opposite of your story. <laughs> you know, first of all, my biggest obstacle was cash <laughs> and the lack of it. Um, so when I graduated from FIT with uh, an associate's degree um, in FBM, that's what it was called at that time, it's no longer called that, um, I had to go out and I had to get a full-time job. I couldn't stay in school. And, you know, I wanted to be a retail buyer. That's why I came to New York City. Unfortunately, they didn't want to pay me. <laughs> so I was interviewing and getting offers, and these numbers will scare all of you, I hope, at $16,000 a year and $15,000 a year. And I realized that literally I couldn't live on that and live in New York City, so I decided to go to the wholesale side first. <laughs> they were paying a little bit more. So I think that was one of my biggest obstacles in my career was just you know, starting someplace where I didn't think I was going to start and didn't think I wanted to start. Um, and I did, and I've been very successful, and you know, great mentors along the way have certainly helped. So. Thank you. Tina, you've had a, a quite a uh, an interesting path. Did you intend to be an in intimate apparel? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, like Victoria, I needed a job, and I searched high and low for a job. And the first person to hire me was a woman called Samantha Robbins, and her company was called Sammy, and she did really beautiful silk, clean, tailored pieces. I'd never heard of her. Luckily for me, a lot of other people had. So I took the job. Even my friend said, why are you doing this? I need the money. Late, a few years later, when I interviewed at Calvin Klein, when I interviewed um, at Carol Hockman, both Calvin and Carol knew of Samantha. They admired her product. They thought it was beautiful. And that was part of the reason I was hired. That and because I could sketch. So there's a lesson there that Sometimes you take a job, and it doesn't have to be for a huge company that everyone's heard of. Work for someone that can teach you something, that maybe does something really beautiful and special, and you'll learn things that other people don't learn. And I was very fortunate to take that job, and that's how it just snowballed. But I had no desire to be in this field. But I love it, but it was not my intention. Sonia, what's the challenge of working for an international company? Yeah, I, um, I had gone the route of 
you know, MBA marketing and landed at L'Oreal and I was in this beautiful tower on Fifth Avenue, but I wasn't allowed to talk to sales to really understand what was going on because sales told marketing what to do. And it was for me such a backward way. So I went and got an operations job at Coach. I took a pay cut and uh, just worked my way up merchandising, then buying full line stores. And then I was always friends with the designers and the VP of design who ended up leaving when they had a big uh, restructuring. She went to Calvin Klein underwear and she called me up and said, hey, we really like you, why don't you come and be a sales person? So I was like, all right, I'll go try that. <laughs> so I went to do sales at Calvin Klein. And, and that's how I got called for ultimately this French lingerie brand, you know, I'd never heard of. And I went to Saks, I was wearing my Calvin Klein underwear. And I was like, oh my God, I'll never be caught dead in this brand because it was a pointy bra. And <laughs> it's like, all right, that's fine. I can sell it. I don't have to wear it. And, um, and then to just have that opportunity to work for a company that is family owned, that has an entrepreneurial spirit, that didn't even ask me if I spoke French in the interview, but thank God I do. <laughs> um, and I never used my French, that which was a major at one point and then a minor all since I was 12 to I was 26, I was in French class. So um, listen, there's always the cultural dimension within our own country, let alone explaining to the French over and over and over again, you know, certain things about this market, about how, yes, we will purchase things over comfort, over style sometimes. But um, I'm very proud, you know, being able to put a, a brand on the map. And I think we'll call has done a wonderful job of, of leading the way in our industry and um, that we could become a, a player. But it's definitely got its challenges, but its rewards. And I will say one thing about intimate apparel, having been in consumer packaged goods and coach leatherwear accessories, and then now intimate apparel is just such a, a great group of, of people. My first Fendi's event, I think I was like, oh my God, this is like a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everyone got up and danced, you know, in between the, the appetizer and the main dish. And I have to say, it's it's really a tight knit network of, of professionals and people that I profoundly respect both personally and professionally. Seth, you uh, started out with peanuts. Do you want to take us from that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I you and Charles the same thing as eating cash. I <laughs> Yeah, I, when I graduated uh, from Brown University, the last thing I thought I would do was be in the ladies' intimate apparel business, even though my family uh, had been in the business for a long time. So uh, I guess the obstacle that I would relate is a little different than everybody else's because my biggest challenge was uh, really determining whether I would uh, follow in the family business or do something different. Uh, my father gave me probably the best advice of my life, which was, you're, you're not obligated to be a part of a family business. You need to do what you want to do, what you feel you're going to be good at and successful at, and most importantly, be happy at. So he gave me what we called the five-year rule, which was you go out for five years and you do whatever it is you want to do. And after five years, if you're interested in coming into the family business, you're more than welcome. If not, we certainly understand that. And if you do come into the family business and you decide you hate everybody, you will have put in five years uh, and experience to be able to land on your feet. So uh, Karen alluded to the fact that I went to work for Charles Schultz, uh, America's most famous cartoonist uh, out in California, and worked for a company that um, was in the gift industry, toy industry, and was at the forefront of licensing at that time, uh, run by a woman named Connie Boucher, who back in the late 50s and early 60s was really the, uh, the leading woman in the licensing trade uh, and really sort of put it on the map in a lot of categories in this country. Um, learned a whole lot out there. Uh, and after five years, I decided uh, that I, I did want to be a part of the family business and, and made the choice to do so. And uh, I couldn't be happier. I've been in this industry now 31 years. Um, working for two companies, running my own, my family's own business, selling that in 1996, and then working for Carol Hockman Design Group since then. And as uh, Karen mentioned earlier, we were purchased by Comar uh, three and a half years ago. 
uh, and now we are part of what is, uh, I think, probably the largest sleepwear company uh, in the world today. So we're uh, we're very excited about that, and uh, that that choice. You know, Barbara talked about choices before. Um, that was the choice for me. You know, where I wanted to go, and uh, thankfully, I think made a good one. How many licenses does Comar have now? Uh, we have well over 60. Uh, that's inflated a little bit by our kids business where we have so many of the Disney and Marvel and uh, you know kids licenses of that nature. But uh, today we have you know a portfolio of brands led by Ralph Lauren, Donna Karen, Oscar De La Renta, Betsy Johnson, Tommy Bahama, uh, Nicole Miller. Eileen West and so on and so on. So it's a, it's an impressive portfolio and uh, it's, it's a nice one to have in your toolbox. It's interesting because you've really come full circle from the world of licensing and now you're back into it in, in, a, in a totally different way. You never know how your life and your first experiences are going to come back around. Um, when I graduated FIT, I actually became an assistant buyer at Belk Stores, and that was my first job was in buying, and then I decided to go a different route. So we all, we, you never know how it's going to all work out. Maureen, you have, uh, you represent, uh, I think, the fast-growing uh, segment of the industry online. How is that different, do you think, from your experience being in a brick-and-mortar? I actually think being in brick and mortar, uh, I was work for, as you all heard, uh, for a long time for Lord & Taylor. Prior to that, there was a company called Bamberger's that was part of Macy's, and I always say I kind of grew up there. I started there right out of college. Um, and then from there, I actually had the great fortune of working for Wacol for about a year, and then chose back to go to FMG. And during this entire time, I've been talking to these two young guys who were starting an e-commerce site, and I'm like, they're crazy. Yeah, they want to sell bras online, what are they, nuts? But after talking with them a while and uh, doing some research about them, because it is a privately owned company, uh, really intrigued me. And when I first started, I had no idea how my experience, except from buying intimate apparel, but then how do you translate all of that online? And could you really get people to buy bras and lingerie online? Um, but it intrigued me. Uh, it was one of those things, if you had talked to me 15 years prior, I would have been, oh, no, there's, you know, I'll never work for an online company. Uh, but I went ahead and went to work for the young crazy guys. And one guy had hair down the here. And I was like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> but uh, the great part of that is working in brick and mortar and certainly working in the buying lines that I was in, it really taught you creativity. It taught you to how to plan a business, but to be very fiscally responsible um, and to do both things, to drive sales, to make sure you are achieving company uh, financial goals, as well as establishing strong partnerships with vendors. And a lot of that is really what helped me make the transition to online. Um, we were as Karen mentioned, really one of the first people to say, okay, we're going to sell into a parallel line. And a lot of my first year, year and a half of the, this position was going to vendors and convincing you to sell us online. And believe me, it was, a lot of people were like, you, you all are really, I don't know what you're thinking. Uh, we jokingly say this is one vendor we talked to for a year and a half. I could have showed you the line before they finally said yes, <laughs> that they would sell us. But it is part of that establishing relationships and understanding how to build them, how to grow a business, um, and then once you have that business, how do you make sure that it's uh, fiscally successful? And then the other big piece is the creativity piece, uh, because it goes from something that's very concrete to your customers can touch and feel things to, okay, I'm selling it now on their computer. They can't touch it, they can't look at it, they can't try it on, and how do you make that sale happen without really being there and showing them the product. And it takes a lot of creativity. And uh, I will tell you every single day, we ask that same question over and over again. Gee, this is good, but what can be better? How do we do this better? How do we make it easier, faster, smarter, a better experience? Um, and I think, obviously, all retailers do that. I think the additional challenge in e-commerce is challenge. you're selling this thing on the screen yeah. that nobody can It's touch. a challenge because, you yeah. know, one of the big things of sell in selling bras is fit, of course. So, you know. Yeah. I, and I, one of our 
biggest things, and you know, a lot of people here on the panel have heard this, but I think one of the things that have made our company different is we try on a lot of the product. We will not buy product without really trying it on, believing in it, um, making sure that it is something we can support to our customers. We also have a full-time customer service department who we educate, we train to specifically help for those fitting issues. Uh, we have real people who you call up. They are bra fitters. They've been trained by Waco, by Ethan, by Chantel. Uh, we have gone out of our way to make sure these, that they really know how to help people over the phone. How many people work for your company? Front of house, we're now up to about 70, and then our warehouse, it varies year by, you know, just based upon the time of the year, but back of house is probably easily 70 to 100 people, mm -hmm. just varies. And when I started, I was associate number six, I think. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, and we actually picked and pulled orders. I always laugh. I think I gave away a lot of free product when I first started. I had no idea what I was doing. Just throwing it in a box and shipping it. An extra bra right, to right, when whatever. you ordered. <laughs> Amy, you had a statement in your bio that I loved. At 25, I have accomplished more than what I expected to accomplish in a lifetime. I think that's great. You want to share some of that? Um, wow. Uh, my FIT experience was one for the ages, I think. Um, I was all about getting involved in everything the school has to offer, and I hope everyone here is taking those same advantages. Because you get more here than you can anywhere else. There's so many more connections, so many more networking opportunities than any other school, I believe, around the world. Um, a lot of my experience has been through the club. I was involved in Under Fashion Club with the scholarships. I received scholarships my junior and senior year uh, through the Under Fashion Club. I also participated in a paid internship between my junior and senior year through the Under Fashion Club. And I participated in the Femi Gala uh, my senior year. And uh, that was truly a life-changing experience. Um, after graduation, I was selected to come back and participate in the Supima Cotton Fashion Show um, to represent FIT, where I worked um, for my first three months after graduation, still upstairs in the C building, uh, where I came back every day and we worked to build a five-look evening wear collection that debuted on the stages at New York Fashion Week and Lincoln Center. Um, so to get to have that experience at 25 was really just unbelievable. Um, and to have this great network behind us is unbelievable. I would say most of the opportunities that have come to me since graduation have been through networking and through people that I've met um, through this club, through this industry, through this school. And uh, if there's one piece of advice I can give, it's that please network, go meet everyone you can, grab business cards, talk to them, tell your story, find out theirs. Uh, you never know when that's going to come back to help you. Great. Alex, you uh, come to the industry in a different way, but I think also you have a lot to share in terms of your experiences here at FIT. You have your Bachelor of Fine Arts in Photography, and she is an amazing photographer. I've used her professionally uh, several times. She's fabulous. Um, but then she uh, went on to become a creative director. So maybe share a little bit of that path, because I think that's very interesting. Yeah, after graduating in 2011, I um, pursued my career of being a fashion photographer. And from there, I became the creative director at Elite Brands, where I launched their Isaac Mizrahi division. And I was responsible for developing a collection of fashion forward camera bags, which was a really incredible opportunity. Um, from there, I became the founder of ALX Creatives, which is a visual branding business. We help small businesses brand themselves through the use of powerful visual imagery. Um, and really, like I say, in the last three years I've learned it's not about thinking of yourself as a designer or as an artist, but really as a brand. Um, you're always going to be your brand's best ambassador, which leads me to what like, Amy was talking about, which is leveraging the network here at FIT. Um, leveraging the network you have here today to get you where you want to be tomorrow. Um, you know, look around, a few steps away, you're surrounded by photographers, graphic designers, all these different types of artists that can really help you and you guys can help each other build a powerful brand here today. Um, so yeah. Great. Thank you. So we represent a lot of different facets of the industry here today. We have, you know, the whole digital piece. We have the brick and mortar piece. We have design. We have merchandising. We have 
tremendous amount of, of diversity. Um, I don't know, I guess, Barbara, I'll start with you. If, if you're looking for a, an intern or if you're looking, if you have an opening, what are some of the qualities that you're looking for? What are some of the... Sure. Um, I think the number one quality <clears throat> that I look for is passion. You know, really have a passion for what you do. You can teach someone to add one and one equal two. You can really teach how to analyze a business. But when you're really looking for someone who loves what they do and has a passion for what they do, I think that's probably the most important thing that I look for uh, when I'm looking for someone. Is that communicated to you through the personal interview? Is it the resume that resonates with you? What you know, I think... Listen, I think a resume is very important. The first thing that I do see is a resume. I'm reading through a resume. Um, I think experience, um, I think someone mentioned um, Amy and Alexa on that panel, um, grab everything you can in terms of networking and getting your experiences, whether it's you know, if you can afford the time to work um, in a store or get your internships or even just talking to anybody that you can to gain experience about about the industry, um, that will come through on a resume. But it's really, if the resume has the bones of what, of what we're looking for, it's really that one-on-one -on -one and you've got five, maybe 10 minutes to make that first impression. And I can't tell you how many people and young people impress me um, every single time I interview with their dedication and their passion and their willingness to work and they want to be in the industry. So I think it's really that first five to ten minutes and you know you're talking to this person that passion really does need to come through um, and then you know reviewing the talent, reviewing the portfolio. Sometimes we give a project, sometimes we we don't. Um, I also think the other important thing as you do go on interviews is to really know the company that you're um, interviewing for. Do your research. Do a little bit. And we can Google. The internet is fantastic. Um, you should be visiting the store that you're interviewing for, visiting the department that you're interviewing for. Really have a great working knowledge of, of the company and the workings and the culture that, that that company has. I think that would be um, something that I also look for as well. Uh, Sonia, from a, uh, you mentioned they didn't ask you if you knew French, but you happened to, which is great. Do you think that being uh, bilingual or w the advantage of, of knowing language is really important, or how do you think that has impacted you in terms of your own ability to move forward? Yeah, there's, there's no doubt that with our uh, company being based in Paris, a lot of the documents are in French. And whereas, you know, they tried to translate a lot of them. We have to work fast and we have to work off of the French. So um, French language skills does end up being a priority for us in internships, just uh, to, on the practical side. The second thing is, I think our most successful interns have been the ones that are entrepreneurial and they seek out the information. So they've got good listening skills, you know, you exhibit that in, in the interview, and they've been resourceful and they've, they've done their homework before coming to the, to the interview, but then also you see that on the job, because very often you just have to say what needs to get done, and there can't be too much back and forth about how to do it. Um, so I think just bringing really good communication skills and organizational skills, because that just propels you into being star intern, and star intern becomes employee um, very often. Seth, how many interns do you take in? We have generally 15 to 20 uh, at Carol Hockman Design Group. Uh, Resumes. <laughs> Resumes. And then at Comar, certainly we have about an equal amount. So I would say at the peak during the summer, we have 25 to 30. Uh, and it's a, the intern program is something that we believe very much in. Uh, we have a lot of people uh, that have come through the intern program who have worked for us, uh, Amy worked for us, uh, you know, coming through that program and, and what she said I thought was very eloquent and wonderful advice for each and every one of you sitting in the, uh, 
in the audience, the networking and the getting out and getting involved and showing your energy, your passion, your enthusiasm for what you want to do. If, it's, if this is a business you want to be in, will work for you. Um, so the intern program is uh, it's important. I, I've always said it's our lifeline. Uh, when I look at the amount of people uh, that have come out of FIT through the intern program or just out of FIT that we have, uh, you know, we have probably 140 design people uh, in the total Comar organization uh, up and down. And I, I haven't looked at it, but I got to believe that 30, 30 plus percent of them, 35 percent of them come out of FIT. So this has been a wonderful uh, uh, a factory for us coming out of FIT. And we appreciate all the talent uh, that is uh, been generated out of here. Thank you. Um, one of the things Clelia mentioned in the internship program is that it is sponsored by the End of Fashion Club, and what that means is that we actually do underwrite the cost of the internship program, so you do get paid. Um, and I know that in, in many cases, interns don't get paid. Um, so, Victoria, how do you handle interns, and what are some of the opportunities at Delta Galil? Um, yeah, we certainly always have interns, and um, they are always paid at Delta Galil. Um, it's a company policy that they must be paid. Right now, we probably have, at any given time, probably eight to ten. Um, and it does go up in the summer, and, and we do take full advantage of the Under Fashion Club internship program. But, um, you know, I, I agree with Barbara and, and some of my other peers up here on the panel. I think confidence is key when you go into that interview, you know, showing um, the interviewer that you've done your homework on the company and that you're well informed, not only on the company, but on the person. Because to Barbara's point today, the you know, <laughs> Internet, Google, LinkedIn is a wealth of information about just about anyone and anything. Um, and I think that's important. And just, you know, what I think, don't forget, you, you have a lot to offer us a lot to offer us and you have to think about that and sell us on that and you know you've grown up with excel and powerpoint and prezies and you know you're probably very good at presentation skills so i think that you've just got to come up with what you have to offer that company and you know examples of things that you've done in the past even if it's from the classroom versus true work experience because that's what we need and that's what we look for and i you know i was a student here <laughs> which is pretty funny, as early as 2011, where I was finishing a bachelor's degree that I just never got around to finishing. So I have to say how much I enjoyed being back here as a student, although it was a little embarrassing for me. Um, I did walk into a classroom one day and have the professor who was there before the, our class say to me, next week we have a final, so I'm really going to need the class until 6.30. Is that okay? And I said, it's okay with me, but I'm not the professor in this class. <laughs> so it was a little embarrassing, but what I, what I got out of that experience was a connection to the students here and a respect for the students here and for how prepared you are and how connected you are to our industry. And I was just blown away by that because obviously when I was a young student, I couldn't appreciate that, but I could appreciate it now. So I think that's really important. Yeah, the talent, the talent here is just exceptional. We, we've seen that several years in a row. And the design contest at, uh, at our FEMI dinner it really just blows us away every, every year. Um, Maureen, in the digital space, what are, you, what, what are you looking for most when you're looking to bring somebody on? So a lot of it, you know, even though we are e-commerce, a lot of that, um, what... Uh, Barbara and Victoria talked about. It's the same, and I think for us, uh, the example about what are some things that you have done, and that whether it's for the classroom, whether it was, gee, I, I managed a store or whatever, we like to see good and bad. You know, what were the situations that you were in? How did you handle them? How did you turn a bad situation into a good one? And maybe the bad one stayed bad, but what did you learn about that? Uh, a lot of what we do is thinking quickly on your feet. Uh, to Victoria's point, a lot of time, is, or uh, something you mentioned it too, here's the project, we point you in the right direction, but a lot of it is about your resourcefulness, your creativity, your critical thinking skills, and be able to get through all of that. Um, 
and to be able to come back and go, I did this, I did this, and this is what I've done, and you know, I'm stuck here, so you know, help me the next thing. But it is a lot about your ability to work through things, and I think the idea of bringing uh, what you've worked on in school is a great example to show somebody, this is what I've done. Mm -hmm. um, and it is about really understanding the company that you're working for, and what is it that they offer uh, and that you can bring to them. Um, you know, we are a smaller size company. Everybody in our company knows everyone. All the departments, uh, we have our own creative department, our own marketing department, our own IT department, customer service and merchandising departments. Uh, so there's a lot of teams that all interact with each other and you have to be able to work with all different types of people, all different creativity levels and different ways they approach issues. Uh, and we laugh, we sit with creative people, go, okay, let me put on my creative hat and start thinking so that we can share ideas with them. And you really have to be a little bit of a chameleon to do a lot of that, but ultimately get where you want to get to as well, too. And do you pay your interns? We absolutely do, yeah. Okay. We, uh, there was a big thing, the yeah. reason I'm bringing that up is because there was a big thing with Vogue, I'm sure everybody heard about it, and uh, as a result of that, they weren't paying their interns, but they were working them to death, and so it became a big story, and now they don't have an internship program anymore at Condé Nast, which I think is ridiculous. Um, but, uh, I, and I, you know, as a public relations agency, we've always paid our interns, but I do know that many, many, many of PR agencies do not pay their interns. Um, and that's a decision you all have to make. Uh, you know, is this experience uh, going to be the kind of experience that you want to put onto your resume that really is going to add value to you for the next experience? So, you know, there are paid internships, but they're also unpaid. It doesn't mean you shouldn't take it if you can afford to take it if it isn't a paid internship. Amy, what was maybe one of the most um, I guess complicated or 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 challenging interviews that you had in your uh, various interviews, going out there and being having such a great background. But um, I don't know that the interviews themselves were were as challenging as the frustration at the job market. Um, I went into looking for positions much later than the rest of my peers. So they had all really had positions by the time I was looking really towards the end of the year and the competition finished. And towards the end of the year, it seems that there's less and less positions available and budgets are getting tighter. Um, and that was really my frustration because I felt like I gave 100% that I could at FIT, that I was involved in this. I did student council. I did FITSA. I was president at this club, an intimate apparel club. And I was just like ready to go into the market and there wasn't anything available. And there was a few interviews here and there, um, but it came and it went and I wasn't chosen. And it was a little frustrating. It was like, what could I have done differently? And what it finally came down to is I started going through those business cards of people that I had met, reaching out, letting people know that I was looking. Um, and it came through a contact that I made at the Femi Gala that night at the Under Fashion Club, and I got my first job, just like that. Making a phone call, making a connection, letting them know that I was looking. Um, so much so, even right now, a lot of my um, former former students and uh, that went to school with me contact me when they're looking all the time. We all hear about things at our company before they get posted online or get posted to job websites, and you have the first chance that if you know someone at that company, you got a better in. So even everyone sitting next to you right now, network. <laughs> start getting their names, start getting their business cards, because it will come around. Yeah, and the networking can be done, uh, you know, a lot of different ways, but definitely, you know, joining the clubs and, and looking for opportunities uh, and events that you're in, that can that can be open to you as students, um, I think are really, uh, you know, it's very good advice because you never know who you're going to meet um, that might open a door for you. And, uh, you know, I'm often at events and people come up, oh, would you interview this person for me? Or this person is looking for a job, would you mind meeting them? and I always try to make myself or my staff available to at least have a conversational interview so that you know you have some idea as to what's going on. And sometimes I've had conversational interviews that have resulted in them getting a position. So you just never know. Um, Alex, I think, has taken a big step. She started her own company. Um, tell us about the challenge of that. And 
Well, I started when I graduated, I was a freelancing artist. And so I'm used to the hustle of that, which is always a challenge. But I think the hardest part for me is, you know, you might reach out to 100 people and only one person gets back to you. But if you're really, really passionate about what you're doing, it only takes that one person to really change your career. Um, through networking and always keeping different opportunities open, I walked into Elite Brands one day not having really no idea what was going to come of it. And they said, we're looking for somebody to develop a collection of camera bags for our new license, Zrahi. And I thought, I could probably do it. And so I went home and I, you know, thought about it. And so I pitched them. I said, listen, I, you know, I kind of fake, I, sometimes I say fake it until you make it, but I kind of faked it a little bit. And I was like, I have design experience in the fashion industry. I can design this collection. I feel like if you're resourceful enough and you really believe in your skills, you can make, you can make it happen. Um, being there every day, I was constantly giving them ideas about social media and how to really transform their visual presence. And so by doing that, I ended up creating a space for myself within the company and becoming their creative director. And I think you just always have to be really open-minded. You never really know where your path is going to take you. Um, I always thought I was going to be a photographer. That's what I studied. That's what I was passionate about doing. But my career just opened, opened my eyes to other opportunities. And so I would say just stay open-minded and always follow your dreams. Um, it's incredible how, like, what can come of just pursuing what you're passionate about. Um, and you'll end up surprising yourself every day. So... You know what, I think that's probably such good advice for, and I've heard the word passion coming down the row here, and, and it is true, because if you're passionate about what you're doing and you love what you're doing, you're going to do a great job. And you may not get to exactly where you want to get to right off the bat, but if you follow that path and you're passionate about it, you're going to be happy, and I think that's the most important thing. I think maybe I should open this up for some Q&A. What do you think? Ros, Ros Hart is here. I want to just introduce Rosalind Hart. Uh, Rosalind uh, received our Lifetime Achievement Award this year and the President's Award. Well, it was definitely for a Lifetime Achievement. But um, Roz celebrated her 90th birthday and her 60th year in business this year. So that is... <laughs> Do we have any questions for anybody? Everybody has. At the beginning of the presentation, you said that intimate apparel was one of the fastest growing sectors of the industry. Uh, so I'm wondering why you all think that is. Like, what is it that's making this market grow so quickly? Okay. Um, I'm going to let, I'll, I'll let the panel answer it. I have an answer, but I'll go ahead. Seth, maybe? Oh, boy. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good one. <clears throat> well, first off, you're dealing with a, a product, particularly in bras and panties, that is, I think, a necessity for everybody on this panel except me. So, bras, too much information. Uh, <laughs> So you're dealing with a product that is certainly a necessity. Um, my side of the business, which is sleepwear, uh, is certainly much more of an impulse business. Uh, but you know, the sleepwear business has become a fashion business. You look at you know the runway uh, presentations uh, consistently each and every year, and the the influence that is lingerie driven uh, is. It continues to grow. It's an exciting, fun, you know, uh, product category that people really, uh, you know, seem to enjoy. Obviously, uh, on the sleepwear side, and you know, the bra and panty business has been transformed over the last 30 years, led by Victoria's Secret. You know, they've made it an, an amazing uh, business. They've been a an unbelievable marketing machine, and you know they've made that whole category. They've really metamorphosized it from what it was in the in the early '80s, um, and, and made really made the whole industry uh, something that's very unique and exciting. 
And I think the other thing, and you know, I always talk about Oprah a little bit, but you know, <laughs> how many years ago already? Eight years ago, she did this whole thing about bra fitting and how women really wear the wrong size bra. And I think for us, and I was at their necessities even when that happened, it really was a little bit of awakening to the American woman about you can do better and you should do better and you should figure out what bra size you wear and it's out there you need to go do it and it's not a five dollar bra it's not the bra that's going to help you and because of that it really woke up the consumer it forced retailers to wake up and it forced the industry as well to say wow we have women now who want to buy bras and they're not all age cups and they're they're g and f and age cups and we really have to fulfill this customer's need and because of that it really got the industry to grow in a very big way uh you know and to get people like Chantel and Eveton and you know it was another whole new growth level for Wacol and even the more opening price point guys it, it was really an infusion of um business that women were demanding and knowing they could do better. And I think that's a very big piece of what kept this going. Yeah. I also oh. think that innovation and creating a need from a want mm -hmm. um, is also very critical. There's tremendous innovation, you know, within the bra industry, there's definitely innovation, newer, lighter, better, um, prettier. Um, even in the sleepwear business, yeah. whether it's you know, a specific cooling fabric for women of a certain age or um, whatever it is, I also think that innovation drives our, our industry as well, which, which is very creative. And if there are any of you out there who are interested in being broad designers, it can be a very lucrative oh, position. There aren't that many. And they're aging quickly. I know most of them. <laughs> and you might want to go into that field. It is and if you look very at, difficult. And if you look right. at the MPD reports right now, what has been you know a bit troublesome to all of us up here is that for the last two or three years, the bra side piece of the business has been sort of stagnant, you know, very limited growth. Whereas the sleepwear side of the business has been double-digit growth in some years, and part of that is lifestyle, but a lot of that is a lack of newness and innovation to drive that consumer into stores for new bras. So if there are bra designers out there, <laughs> big opportunities for you await. Agreed. I think also um, there's the, the whole loungewear category, Absolutely. which comes, you know, becomes lifestyle. I mean, I just came back from Puerto Rico. I mean, yeah, people were wearing loungewear that, you know, was, is in the sleepwear department. Um, so there's a lot of crossover now, I think, too, in those categories of sleepwear and loungewear well. and activewear. And, you know, that's all part. I mean, when we say intimate apparel, it's kind of broader than that. And bras definitely drive a major part of the segment. Segment because they are necessity panties certainly drive a major part of the segment um, and and the you know to your point the whole technology piece has has really taken the industry to a whole other level so um, but yeah for those who are interested yes you want to Hi, actually I'd like to say thank you to Maureen first because I love Bare Necessities and it's been really helpful. Um, I read an article recently that on the Huffington Post it said that the average bra size in America has gone up from 34B to 34DD uh, in just two decades. So um, obviously through my own personal experience and other people's experiences that I know, uh, it's been like quite hard to shop for specialty sizing. So have you actually seen like, I know that you guys just mentioned that there's been an increase in uh, sleepwear, but have you seen a noticeable increase, I guess, in specialty sizing? And I guess like, are there any challenges with that that you guys have faced? Um, the fastest growing piece of the distance, and it really has been that way probably for the past seven, you know, years has been, we call it full busted, and then we call it plus size. Um, the average figure woman, to your point, even when I was at Lord & Taylor, we, we were so focused on 34 Bs, 34 Cs, anything above a D, we were like, oh, I can't buy that. And, you know, so as a result, it, the industry also, we weren't requiring them to go after that. And then when Oprah did her show, and, you know, the beauty of e-commerce is you don't have to worry about how a floor looks, uh, you can get away with a faster stock turn, 
we were able to really start going after that full vested M plus size customer um, for a lot of different reasons. You know, department stores, and believe me, I grew up in department stores. You can't carry the sizes. You can't be responsible for the turn. That has really fed a lot of the business that went on. As that business kept getting bigger, we in turn kept going through the vendors, and we still have the conversations. You've got to go bigger. You've got to have bigger back sizes. You've got to have bigger cup sizes. This is the woman who's out there shopping. Her needs are not being serviced. And also small backs and big cups, 20 backs and 30 backs, you know, double D, triple D. That's what is needed out there. And that's also sparked a lot of the innovation that, you know, we talk about. And there's more to even come within that. Um, you know, just really quickly on the whole sleepwear piece is the, the, there's so much blurred lines anymore between what is sleepwear, what is loungewear, and what is suitable to wear out. Uh, and even in workout wear, we 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 work on athleisure wear because you can't, you're not going to the gym, you're looking like you are, but you're really out walking around. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's crossing in the sleepwear. I told Seth this story and you guys all laugh at me. I actually wore a Nicole Miller nightgown on my vacation a year ago. <laughs> Everybody said, like, I love your dress, I love your dress. I'm like, thank you. I'm not telling you it's a nightgown. You know, but that that is the beauty of what's going on right now. And it's a lot less expensive than the and Diane von Furstenberg dress. I'm like, yeah, nobody knows. But you know, that is a lot of what's going on. Yeah. Your, your question focused on you know bra sizes from a sleepwear standpoint, which certainly I know and Victoria knows, you know, and in the sleepwear. The average size of the woman today you know, is a 14 to 16. Yeah. You know, 10 years ago, it was a 10 to 12. So the country is growing on, on every level, uh, no pun intended. Um, but the single, you know, one of the single biggest upsides in all of our businesses today is special sizes because that customer is dramatically underserved, whether it be petites or whether it be plus sizes in, in so many of our channels of business, uh, it's our best sell throughs. It's our fastest growing businesses as a percent total. Um, you know, you have avenues like a, like a QVC who is, you know, they sell half their good. We sell half our product. Uh, over 50% of our goods in 1X, 2X, and 3X. And when we run petites in an item, it's the first thing to sell out. So you are you know, cre clearly looking at an underserved population uh, in, in the many of these special sizes. And I think across you know, everybody that's in the panel, you know, whether we're making or selling, a wholesale or manufacturing, I think we all recognize that that's uh, uh, an arena that we, we're all focused on today. It's a real engineering feat to create a bra for a J, a size J. So, right, Victor? <laughs> you know for sure. Yes? Uh, Is it a question now? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, so I have a question uh, similar but opposite side of the spectrum. I read an article recently about um, a company that's brand new called Yellowberry, and it's about tween underwear and bras that are appropriate for tweens. Um, is this a new niche? Is this part of intimate wear? Or maybe it's child, children's wear? Or is this something that they said they're the first ones to be appropriate bras for tweens? And I couldn't imagine There used that. to be a company um, called Teen Form, right? Yeah, I, I, I unfortunately have not heard of them, but I can tell you they're probably not the first one. Yeah, yeah. I saw them on Facebook. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's so amazing all the people, this Bar Raphael, whoever it is, like, oh, I started my own line because there's nothing out there. And I think, um, were you going to speak to the other children one? No, I was just going to talk to, you know, about it's children's and teens. I mean, we do a lot of kids' bras and tween bras, um, so does tween brands and Justice. And, you know, there are retailers out there who service that customer. And, you know, it's, it's a fine line because, you know, you have to be very careful of what those products look like. They have to be age appropriate. Um, but, yeah, they're, you know, they're definitely out there, and that's a market. It's certainly a market, um, particularly the tween market. You know, she's not quite ready to fit into the pink bras or the VS bras. Um, that's her older sister, and so she aspires to that. And that's really kind of what has started the whole tween bra market because of pink. Well, that line in particular started by a young girl, a very young girl who decided that bras that were meant for her age group were too risque, too provocative, too whatever. So she started this line, and she kept it very safe. 
very pretty and very almost childlike and it's taken off because it's of her it. yeah it's her it's she, because she wears it and she gets it and she's conveyed that t- message out to other mostly parents quite frankly yeah. who don't want their daughters in you know little tiny triangle bras when they should be wearing something more appropriate and I think I was going to add, you know, Seth, Seth mentioned, you know, how revolutionary VS has been. So on the fringes of VS, where they haven't wanted to do larger sizes because apparently Les Wexner never wanted to see a large cup on the conference room table or on the other end of the spectrum, you know, the over-sexualization of VS or you know, bordering into pink. You even see it, that other brand, Aerie, you know, mm-hmm. American Eagle, that does yeah, a Eagle. phenomenal job. I, you know, when you go into their stores and see the progress they've made in the past year, of walking that fine line between being the young girl and not, you know, having to live your sexuality at, at 12. You know, I think uh, it's it's been great. You know, and VS, they've been struggling more. I mean, granted, they've been very successful and revolutionary, but... Um, you know, they're, you know, they're all of a sudden they're advertising about fitting and they're, adver- you know, they're doing a lot of things you never would have dreamt because they're trying to um, stem off the competition that is sprouting up on the fringes. Uh, on the other side of things to um, VS, do you see um, something like Agent Provocateur affecting the types of products that you sell and the types of products that you make, obviously, at a different in a different realm and a different price point and different sizes, um, but I feel like they're kind of on the other, like, luxury, luxury side as opposed to VS. So on our site, we have ventured into more expensive, you know, we cross the line between calling it sexy and boudoir. Um, it's beautiful product. Uh, it is not a mainstay of the business. I, I think there's a specific customer who's looking for that, especially at a higher price point. Uh, the great news is, is they're, because of Agent Provocateur, and they have an opening price point line called La Agent that was done by the Cruz sisters. Um, there's Myla, there's um, Maison Close. Uh, beautiful product. It's just today, from our viewpoint, it's not a huge market that's out there right now. But it's a lot of fun to buy. It's a lot of fun to photo- photograph and put up. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> it's a gorgeous product. I mean, it's it's a very minimal market. Yeah. Um, you know, we make Donna Karen uh, sleepwear, which is wonderful, beautiful product. Uh, but it's it's a, they're small businesses. Um, you've got Saks, you've got Neiman's that cater to this customer. You have Saks, who today wants to become even more luxe. So. Those businesses may expand a little bit, but at the end of the day, when you look at the, certainly from the sleepwear market perspective of it, Agent Provocateur is very inspirational to us. We all look at it, we get ideas from it, and we want to figure out how to drill it down to price points that are uh, somewhat accessible to people. So it's it's a sort of a, a microscopic business, really. Yeah, because the average price point of uh, Asian Provocateur is probably 150 to 200. Per, right. sure. to 200 well, they have launched. Brand. They have launched a sub brand that is, right. that is more. Yeah, you know, it's attainable. an animal. These sub brands, like in the 60s yeah. to 80s. But I think it's interesting that you that you mentioned Asian Provocateur. Are, are you? Do you mind if I ask? Are you yourself wearing Asian Provocateur? Mm-hmm. But you have it. So I think that's the bigger discussion is that, you know, we, we're seeing a change. You know, at, at my company, we have a very small, intimate um, Tommy Hill figure, and that brand is changing for us. So, you know, we're, we're targeting a younger customer. And it's interesting because in our research, we're definitely seeing a difference in taste and preferences from that millennial consumer and, and the bras that she's buying. She's not, um, she's not as, she wants to show her straps. She doesn't care if you can see her bra through her blouse. Whereas the traditional customer, and by traditional I mean pretty much every other generation but millennials, um, you know, it, it's a functional piece of the wardrobe and particularly, I'm sure um, Sonia goes up against this all the time, the United States consumer is very, very different than her European counterpart and certainly her Asian counterpart. You know, it's it's a real piece of fashion for them and and they soak it up and they love it. And we haven't quite 
got there yet in the United States. It's still a little bit more functional, but each and every day I see that fashion piece of the business becoming a lot more important to this consumer, particularly the millennial consumer. So I think it's interesting that you, that you bring up that question. You're onto something. <laughs> And I, I think what's great to always have those aspiration, aspirational brands, you know, when I, 15 years ago when I started Chantel, well, who are you? I'm like, well, we're between McCole and La Perla, you know, that, that was about it. And then La Perla with the wholesale model, they really couldn't deliver the, the stores a lot. So it's nice that Audrey Provocateur with their concession model can come in because they will run, they'll own the stock and they'll run that piece of the department store. So it could probably do better. And I think we all benefit from having that aspirational product on the floor um, so that you know you don't have to have that the down market like Fredericks of Hollywood. You know, it's 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 always really nice to have that at the luxury level. Karen, as you know, we're, we're live streaming this as well, and we have a question from the live stream that I think goes along with this from uh, Katie Berger. And she asks, within the current economy, do you see the bra customers tending to purchase more basic styles as opposed to years prior when fashion may have driven sales? So it's a little bit of a contrast to what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Who would like to, Barbara, you want to answer that? You know, I, I certainly can answer that. I think um, it's really a fine balance um, and it's interesting because when you look at the economic conditions, that definitely um, plays into whether it's more basic replenishment, which is your black and your nudes and your ivories, versus the more fashion. For Macy's, and obviously um, I can speak to the Macy's business, it is definitely, surprisingly enough, very basic driven. Um, I would say 80% of the business is basic, um, versus 20% is fashion. And you always have to have that fashion um, to attract the customer. It, they're beautiful, but um, many, many times our customer we find um, when she's gonna part with her money, um, which it gets very, very difficult in certain economic times, um, she, she goes for basics, basics with a twist. Um, lace has become very, very important, um, but she may buy a lacy bra, but it may be nude, it may be black. Um, but for Macy's, it's basic driven. Seth, how about do you feel in your uh, business? I'm not equipped to answer on the bra front. On the bra, <laughs> on the bra front. Marine okay. Probably. Yeah, I would have to agree with Barbara. Yeah. You know, we have seen the sell throughs on fashion color increase, so it's mm -hmm. a lot healthier than it has been over the past year. But still, you know, 15 to 20 percent fashion is probably where we're at. I think one of the things that the market has done um, beyond just black and nude, they've done very well about coming out with um, fashion colors that are basic looking, cocos, steel grays, uh, softer pinks, so they're reordable, they're replenishable, but they're a nice alternative. Uh, so those types of colors are becoming nice thirds, they're mm -hmm. nowhere near as big as black and nude. Again, I think some of that also is just the American consumer it right is. now, at least where she is in her head. It took her forever to move out of white, you know, she, she finally That's just right. got around to, you know, finally right. nude is her go-to color. But um, bit by bit, and certainly Certainly, she is looking for color uh, online. We have the benefit of as long as we take the picture and the fashion color, we sell it very well, and we flip out the main image a lot of times. Okay, this is now the new pink bra. Let's put that up. Okay, we've had an eighty percent sell through. Can't get any more. Okay, put the basic back up until the next new fashion color comes mm -hmm. in. I think. That's the biggest difference, one of the biggest difference between uh, the European and the Asian market and the U.S. market. Um, we all, on the panel, most of us travel. Um, I, I'm just back from Asia. And um, it's much more fashion um, overseas than it is here. The American consumer really wants her basics, whereas the European market is much more fashion, fashion color is much, much more prevalent, much, much more important. So uh, as Sonia was talking before about the difference between you know, the French market and, and the women here in the US, that's a huge, huge difference um, between the American market and, and other markets. Mm -hmm. One more question. One more question. Okay. Yes. 
I think one of the things, just coming back to the panel and, and why we're here today, um, I think you all can uh, appreciate the breadth of this industry and the, all the different types of, of career paths you, you can take, um, whether it be design or merchandising, uh, and buying, um, it can be in the creative arts, graphic, they need graphic designers, they need pattern makers, they, you know, there are a million, there's so many hundreds of jobs, really, um, that even aren't all represented here, but, um, so there's a, there's a great industry to look at here and to really delve into and, um, and to look at all the different opportunities that, that might be there in front, in front of you. Uh, yes, I'm very interested in finding um, more about the piece with material development. You know, where's that heading uh, as far as comfort, as far as innovation, you know, technology? Is that a big piece, you know, material type of direction, complementing the, you know, form fitting and Tina with the control freak piece? How's all that going to, you know, get the market into another direction as well? Mm -hmm. Well, definitely technology has played a huge role, but Tina, you probably, uh, and Amy also, I guess, and from a design perspective, you're experiencing that. Well, one of the things I wanted to say was, as designers, if you're designers or if you're, you're technicians, know your fabrics. So many of you are spend a lot of time behind a computer screen. Most designers I meet, most people I interview, they're great with the computer. You make amazing sketches. But what I find is there is there's a little bit of a lack of reality about what a fabric does, what it does on your body, and what it does on a screen are two entirely different things. You can make anything look great on a screen. But I like to meet people and talk to people who actually know how things function. They think about how they fit. They think about this fabric, how you get it on. I see portfolios all the time. And you look at the sketch, but when you really look at it, I can't figure out how you actually get it off. There are things that you can do to set yourself apart from the other from people that are interviewing is by knowing some of those, in some cases, boring things, those basic things. The fabrication is one of them. I was, I've been lucky enough to learn some amazing things from amazing people who are very hands-on. If you got to spend two seconds in a room with someone like Donna Karen and watch her drape, it would blow your mind. And I think if you can't, you don't get that, but you can at least do that yourself. I have um, assistants who come to me and they show me pictures. And I ask them, well, what does that actually look like? Does that actually do that? And they say, I don't know. So I tell them to go back and drape it up and make sure before you show it to me that it can actually do what you're showing me the picture can do. So. It is a great way to set yourself apart and to make people notice you is to know exactly what you're talking about and actually attempt not to make it, just drape it. Get from behind the computer and make sure that what you're doing is actually even possible. And that goes back to fabric technology. I have people who, you know, who don't know cotton spandex from rayon spandex. It's a little thing, but it's a big thing. So do that research and you're, you're miles ahead of others. Um, to the technology aspect of it, I would say the biggest place that I've seen improvements is going to Curb and our trade show. Um, you're constantly seeing new brands that are coming up with technological advances. They're shapewear brands that are now putting aloe vera into their fabrics. And I mean, I can't say to the trend really how it's going to go, but we're seeing more of it coming out, more brands that are launching on technological bases. Um, we're seeing great innovations in much prettier stretch laces. Um, so laces are certainly coming very far and making it in the intimates uh, line, but it's coming, but I think it's coming slowly. Yeah, I agree. I think it's very important as a company, Delta Galil is the DNA of our company is innovation, um, particularly fabric innovation. And to that point, we have a full laboratory in Israel and we have, I think, six or seven full-time technologists there. And we are a broad company, so we don't just do intimate apparel, we also do socks. In fact, the largest grossing Nike performance sock is ours. We have two full-time technologists in Beaverton, Oregon um, at the Nike corporate offices. 
And so it's hugely important. Um, and it just, it, it evolves out into all of our brands and all of our product categories. In sleepwear, it could be, you know, we have a, a trademarked K and Cool, Karen Neuberger Cool. It's, it's a wicking fabric that's built into the yarns themselves versus, um, a, a, you know, after a finished garment treatment. So it's actually in the yarns. Um, it has a much softer hand. And today, I think the consumer, because of our, lo our, our internet access, is so well informed that she's looking for those properties. You know, when it when it gives her a little extra, whether it's a wicking or a cooling fabric, or you know, whether it's shapewear or it's comfort for that matter. We have we have several trademarked um, fabrics. One of them is 360 degree stretch. You know, it's an always stretch garment. You know, she loves that. So whenever she thinks she's getting something special, a little extra, it's definitely she's going to spend a little more money for it, and she's going to spend a little more time learning about the product. You know, it's the consumer is very savvy today. They expect newness. They want newness. They they demand newness. So it's really for every one of us on this panel who's involved on on some level. Uh, innovation is the price of entry. It's something that we have to deal with every day, and we're all in our own way. Uh, you know, we have departments and, and people. We have offices overseas that we are constantly uh, in contact with in research and development and, and developing new products uh, new, with new properties, new characteristics um, that are going to excite and delight the consumer is really what we need to do each and every day. Okay. 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 Well, I hope that you all enjoyed the panel, and please feel free to uh, hang out with us a little bit and come up and ask questions. Um, thank you so much to the panel today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And if you want to become a member of the Under Fashion Club, it's only fifty dollars. So hang out with us. So just remember that too. Thanks again. I'd also like to let everyone know that we have a reception downstairs here. You're all welcome to come down and enjoy the food.